What's up? Welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. This podcast is meant to give you a personal glimpse into the next era of investors and operators. This week we had on Corinne Riley of Greylock. Greylock is one of the oldest and most established venture funds in the world, and the success of their portfolio speaks for itself. Since its founding, the company has invested in companies like Figma, Okta, Airbnb, Nextdoor, and countless others. Within a role, Corinne focuses on teams at the early stages of company development and enterprise software. In this talk, we discuss her winding path from Italy into venture, adopting a product-first mindset as an investor, how business modes change and evolve along with markets, and what Greylock looks for in a pitch. Welcome, everybody, to the Confluence VC Podcast. We have a really dope guest who's uh, spent a lot of time in my hometown, Chicago. We got Corinne Riley from Greylock in the building. Everybody give us a shout out. (laughs) Anyway, uh, we're super excited to have her. We had to jump through a few hoops to get her here, but she's here and uh, we're incredibly grateful for her presence. To start off, how about uh, Corinne, you say what's up and give us uh, a brief, maybe like in one minute's walk through how you got to Greylock. Sure. Thank you. And thanks again for having me. Uh, Super excited to be here. Uh, Super, you know, big fan of the podcast. And so I'm pretty honored. So yeah, super briefly would love to just give you a little background on myself. Maybe I'm not to bore you too much. I'm at Greylock right now. I've been here for the past five months. The path to here has definitely been a bit twisty, turvy, would give a lot of, a lot of components of it is luck and being at the right place at the right time. I'm actually, I'm actually from a very small town in Italy where I pretty much thought I was going to live my entire life and, you know, thought that was going to be my path. It's on the coast of Tuscany near Pisa, I guess you would pretty much put it. No one would be able to point it on the map, but I got really lucky. got into this school after high school in, in Wales called UWC, United World Colleges. And that kind of opened my eyes to the rest of the world that there was a lot more out there. There was this tech world that I could join. And there was a lot of places in the world I wanted to visit before I settled down back in my small home down in Italy and moved out to the U.S. That gave me opportunity to go to school in the U.S. And as you mentioned, I went to Chicago for undergrad. And that's really where I started figuring out that tech was something I wanted to do. I think my big takeaway from my years leading up to here has been just like, take any crazy job that you get a chance to. I, that's led me to weird internships, but, but things that I really love. So worked in Bangladesh for a bit, worked in Mexico. I worked in Paris at a startup. So a bunch of cool things. And so I wouldn't be here without every single one of them. But yeah, that's how I made it out here to the United States after college did, did banking for two years. And now I'm here at Greylock. That's fire. I think you definitely should touch a bit more on a bit more on your time in banking. Similarly to myself, you started off in, in Morgan Stanley. And uh, when you were there, you covered some pretty fire IPOs. You covered Uber, Zoom, and then I'm gonna just take one moment to say thank you to the, the last one, Palantir, which is which is Joe Lonsdale's company, the person who personally, uh, him and Drew Oden and Jake Medwell personally brought me in a venture at ABC when I was 19. So Amazing. please yeah. tell me what it was like for you to uh, go through the first two and uh, help my help my big brothers get rich. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, I think banking was, it was really the right choice for me at the time coming out of U Chicago. And, and I think I got super lucky that I, w- I was in the tech group as well out here in, in Menlo Park. Primarily did IPOs, like you mentioned, and again, right place, right time, was the analyst on Uber, on Zoom, IPOs, and on the Palantir direct listing. It's interesting. I think, obviously, big change from doing IPOs to going into early stage venture. I actually think there's a lot of overlapping learnings that, you know, can be done between those two work streams. The way to define a work stream in IPO, there's pretty much three broad workflows that we do on the banking side. And that's one, the S1 writing, two, investor selling and investor positioning. And lastly, just the math behind it, behind pricing the stock as it compares to to the market, as it compares to their other companies in the market. And the way that I think these workflows relate back are, are an interesting way. When I look at early stage companies, I don't expect a founder to be able to precisely give me a roadmap to how they become a public multi-billion dollar company. I think that would be ridiculous. But I think what it's been able to give me is like having that vision and having the ability to imagine what that road looks like. And 
as I think a lot of us know, Uber, Palantir, and Zoom, they have such different stories, right? Like Mm -hmm. the path from when they were started to when they went public are so different. There's highs, there's lows, and totally different drivers that, that, that led to those. And I've actually leaned on some of the learnings that I made in banking way more often than I thought I would in venture. So it's definitely been a good, it's, it's been a really good kind of backdrop to have as I started here at Greylock. I feel that. Those stories are so different. From Joe starting his days at, at what, PayPal with Elon yeah. and, and Peter. Yeah. And I was just talking to Jay Drain over at Maven about their founding partners naming Zoom and like how crazy <laughs> to where it is today has been. Yeah, it's, that's so cool that you got to see that. It's definitely, it's funny because at the time of Zoom was a huge IPO and so was Uber. They actually went within a couple of weeks of each other. So they were pretty much one on top of the other. And then the Palantir Direct listing was a year later, but or pretty much a year later. It's crazy to see the, when you IPO, your journey is not over. There's so much left so much value left to be had in the company. There's a lot of runway. And so it's been really cool to see these companies progress ever since then. We're almost, almost at our two-year mark of being public for those two companies in this coming spring. Feel it. With that, I would love to hear how you feel that prepared you for venture. I know you hit on a really good point, which is something I try to focus on a ton, which is uh, really just asking founders their vision and just saying, okay, cool. Like you got this, Tam. That's the first check. But like, how the hell do we get there? I love that you take the time to, to sit there and envision that with your founders when they approach yeah. you. Yeah, I love for sure. How you feel that MS, the ultimate training ground, the MGS catalyst, et cetera, like how that prepared you. Yeah, and I think I don't just for think for the record, I, I don't actually, I know a lot of people say like investment banking is the funnel to VC. I, I actually don't believe that to be true. I think there's so many different funnels and there's so many ways of learning. And I think what I learned at Morgan Stanley is one facet of it for sure. And it, it's an important facet, but it's not even close to a hundred percent of the picture. But what it did give me, like you said, one is the storytelling and just being able to envision what drives companies and, and what narratives work, whether it be the first couple of years or the growth years as well. And I think I work with a lot of our portfolio companies as well, who are in you know later stages. And there's a lot of work streams that they do that we help advise on that I feel like the context I've had in banking has been definitely helpful. One, one big, if I were to name like what's one big part of that, it, it is to some degree choosing your metrics, right? That, that's a huge work stream that goes into becoming a public company. You're really deciding what are the metrics that I am going to disclose to the public for from here and thereafter. It's recommended that you don't change the metrics that you show once you're public just because it, you know, you want to be consistent and you want to be able to consistently tell public investors a story. And I think that's a decision that if you start thinking about that earlier on in your life cycle, you're going to be happy that you did that. And so that's definitely advice I give to some of our, our later stage companies and start thinking about intelligently about what metrics matter to you. So that's one facet of it, for example. I think you're spot on. Y'all proved it. You'd have done everything from next door to Figma to what? App Dynamics, Airbnb. The yeah. list goes on. I'm sure and you all are doing this like the series A, series B. You got some lockdown when you're telling people how to focus on these metrics and KPIs and stories. For sure. With that, I would love to talk a little bit about the challenges. Like, what do you think your what do you think are the challenges of switching between banking and venture? Like what yeah. Are the reasons why you shouldn't hire someone from banking? Because we get we get a ton of people on here who are like, yeah, man, if I had to choose between banking and sourcing, it'd definitely be banking if I was going to hire. But I think there's some gaps there. There's there's a lot of things that that are missing, right? So I would say, especially in early stage venture, so much of the job is understanding the product and understanding, like being in a mindset of understanding what user feedback and how to take it and, and implement it in a product and kind of iterate and iterate at a fast speed. That's what you're doing in the early years. And that is part of the the narrative that you don't see. In banking, you're seeing a company that's more mature, that has, in in most cases, has a pretty well-defined go-to-market strategy, and it's really about execution, right? And so you're, while you see in hindsight, what it looked like at the beginning, you're not living it day to day. And that's what you are doing in early stage ventures. You're living it day to day. And that's, when I think about why I chose to be in early stage as opposed to growth or, or some later stage investing, that's what I was most excited about is being part of the, the, the early years where you're incubating, you're, you're taking in new learnings, new feedback, and iterating on that um, as you go along. And so 
it, it's a difficult process and there's so much content out there about how to do that well and how to avoid mistakes and how to, how to be successful in that. And I, at least for me, I think it's, it's, it's all about intellectual honesty. And I really like that part of it. So I just had a dope conversation about that with my partners. It's really interesting to see how a ton of different firms think about it from you all uh, and hear how you think about this right now versus some of the other funds that I've been at and Clay's been at. I would love for you to dive into, if you're open to it, just a bit more about Greylock and, and what areas you all cover. Yeah, for sure. As I, I think I mentioned, so we're early stage. We just closed our 16th fund. It's a billion dollar fund. And this fund will focus as we have before on early stage investing. I'm, I'm on the enterprise team, but we also in, we invest in both enterprise and consumer. So yeah, on the enterprise team, I, there's a huge variety in, in the type of companies that I look at and look for. I would say that I try to be, at least I, we all have different styles, but I think most of us try to be as you know, thesis driven and thematic as possible. And so you could categorize our portfolio. And I think this is actually on our website as well into on the enterprise side into a couple of main categories. We have like our you know, security, we have our infrastructure, SaaS and productivity, observability, health tech. Like those are some main categories that we would define our portfolio within. I personally have been doing definitely a lot in the some productivity spaces, but I've also been spending some time in data analytics as well, for example, and security. So it, it is a pretty wide range um, of things that we look at. I, I've, if I were to give some examples in the last couple, like I've said, I've been here about five months. I've been spending a lot of time within SaaS, for example, I've spent a lot of time in customer success, customer support, event software. I've been doing a lot in RPA as well. So it, it really- Ooh, Yo, out. yo, not to cut you off. Over but it. we are co-authoring a Confluence piece right now in RPA. I'm going to add you to the group chat so we can get you in on that. Perfect. Please do. It was like one of the this first. Like 60, like 60 companies into our market now. So like you need to come join us. That's great. I actually love that. Yeah, it was one of the first, when I started, it was one of the first spaces that I decided to start tackling. Definitely excited for that. I'll, th- I'll, throw you in the, I'll throw you in the group chat. Right now, I think we have three people and then we'll put it out along with the, who is it some company microsoft i believe just launched a pretty big initiative in rpa and we want to just do it do the release off the back of that so let's do it got it perfect would love to okay so can you explain a little bit about you all's process or like thoughts here yeah in terms of like how you all go about cycling through all these areas yeah for sure. What you're looking for, like even more. Yeah, I think I, w- I would actually love to talk about what we look for, what I look for in a pitch. Uh, I think I mentioned this, we're a pretty tight-knit group. One of the partners I work work a lot with is, is Sarah Gua, and she actually, she actually, star, by the way. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> she actually has <laughs> a, a pretty good post, uh, a pretty good blog post out here about, about what she looks for in a pitch. And I, I think it's a good framework to have And I've actually used it a lot when talking to people. So would love to like use that maybe as a framework to think about what what I'm looking for when I speak to companies. And I think, I don't know about you guys, but I do, I I often get asked, what should I bring? What should I bring to this pitch? What are this metrics you're looking for? What's the cutoff? What's my error cutoff? And and my answer is always, there there is no answer to this. I'm sorry. If there were a checklist, my job would be so much easier. (laughs) I'm sure you've experienced this as well. Yep. (laughs) And so, yeah, I think would love to maybe categorize what it is that I look for in a more thematic way, if that makes sense, especially on the series A, which like I mentioned, that's one of our big focuses. And I take a lot of cold emails. I, I try to answer every introduction I get, whether it be a cold email or LinkedIn or from someone that I know or you know, some a warm intro as well. And I, I definitely think there's about five main topics that I try to ask about when we're pitching. And so those main topics are, are about the team, one number team, two is product, three is like the, the defensibility of the product, four is market, and five is distribution. And w- within each of those, I think there's some specific questions that it's important that a founder ask themselves and then present at least some, some answer to, or even if that answer is, I don't know yet, but this is my hypothesis that works too. So I think team is pretty obvious. We want to understand why you, why you're building this, all all the typical questions, like, why are you going to attract, you know, top talent? How are you going to do that? Do you have the ambition to build like an extremely valuable and large company in the space? 
Number two product, I think, is one wait, of the Wait, wait, before, before you hit that, do you care about like industry experience or years of experience or leadership? Or are you more so feeling like trying to measure like their resilience and ability to keep going and get people to join? I, I, I oftentimes get a little choppy there. Yeah, I definitely, we definitely don't, there's no extra premium that you get when you have like X number of years in the industry, I would say. We're definitely open to first-time founders. We're open to founders straight out of college or not even in college or whatever it is, right? It it really is more about your ambition and your vision and and less about, oh, this is my pedigree. This is what I've done. This is all the amazing products. Of course, that's great. And it's always important, but I would say that there is an equal number of people who are super, have had super incredible careers who might not be the right person to create that company. So it really is about the right person with with the right idea at the right time. Does that make sense? I totally agree. hundred percent. I think product, the product side of it is at least for me, like super interesting. I'm sure you guys go through this as well. The main question we're trying to answer is do you deeply understand the user problem that you're solving? Put simply. And I think in a lot of cases, startups fail because they're actually not addressing a market that matters or that, you know, they don't have a, a, a product that matters to the market. And so this is where the, we talked about this a little bit, the, the, the customer discovery work is something that I actually really love to do and be a part of. We do do incubations at Greylock. So I, I, I do love being part of the ideation process as well. But also when I'm in pitches, I try to understand, like, how do you understand that this is the right product? And, and my favorite is when people come to us and say, hey, we've had these X number of conversations and coming from these conversations, this is our hypothesis on what the product should look like and should develop as. Mm. And then as a corollary to that is defensibility of the product. We have a lot of, there's actually a lot of content within Greylock about moats, about what your moat is for the long run. And I think the big question is when people come after you because they eventually will, what is going to be your moat that's going to, to keep you as number one? I'm sure you guys deal with that question all the time. It's, I think it's one of the, it's it's a relevant problem. There are usually a a lot of folks going after like the same exact market. So what differentiates you? How does this work long-term? What's the hook? Yeah. And I think I I don't necessarily, we try not to come into this with a predetermined answer in our head, right? Like it is up to the founder to tell us their hypothesis. Like they're the people making the company at the end of the day. And I'm definitely open to whatever they think that moat is. And I and I'm super interested in that hypothesis. And I think in a lot of cases, the, tr- the truth is moats change and they develop as markets develop. But I think having at least mm-hmm. a theory or a hypothesis on what that is, is important to us to, to at least like begin that conversation. Yeah, I actually really like that you said that. On our last podcast, uh, we had someone from Wonder VC come on. And we were talking about like gems that have been dropped. And I think the the point that you just made about mulch changing and evolving over time is something that will stick with me. So thank you for that. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate you calling that a gem. Just giving people credit when it's due. I love it. I love it. But yeah, I think the last two topics that I think always should get addressed in a pitch are also corollaries of each other, which is market, do you understand the landscape? And do you understand if you're a category disruptor or a category creator? And I think the answer to those questions impact greatly the last point, which is distribution. Why is it that the the distribution idea that you have is going to work, is going to be sticky, is going to be viral, et cetera. I think a lot of times, at least for me, the most, one of the more, more frustrating things that I've experienced is when someone will say, oh, this, they have a very broad initial customer and they'll say, everyone can use this. And, you know, there's cases where that's theoretically true. And I totally believe that everyone could use this, but that's not like a realistic depiction of, of how the world works. And everyone's not going to use this on day one. And so I think the main question here is what defines the group of people that will use and drive the first adoption of your product? And if you have a very good thesis on what the answer to that is, I think all of a sudden you have a motion that you can start executing on and prove yourself correct in in a very short period of time. So those are the five main things I would say we look for. I love just putting that out there for people because this is a question I get a lot. I'm sure you get a lot and there is content out there about it, but I just, you, you really can never emphasize it enough. I don't know. I think that stuff just gets drowned. What I really love though is for on our next newsletter, if you shared some of your favorite Greylock pieces, we would love to have those as some of the content for our newsletter. Every week we put out yeah. things that we think the, the, the field just needs to read about. Not on sure. given them that they're like from 2014. 
I just, some of them are timeless. <laughs> exactly. Some of the best stuff I read is super old. Like I have, I found a Cornell study for the like statistically greatest due diligence question you can have. And I think it was like 2009. Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Sometimes I read things about, oh, this is how marketplaces work or something like that. And it's just spot on. And you realize it's, it's pre-Uber and in your mind, your first example is Uber or something like that or Amazon. And you realize that this person just wrote a really insightful piece. Uh, you know, about, life really, doesn't change that fast. Yeah. Like, it's, it's usually the same thing presented in a different way or just more efficient. Yeah. More connected. Yeah. And I think it, it really does go back to the notion of intellectual honesty, which is, I think, a big, at least a big thing for me. And from my experience, what, what we've seen at Greylock is, like I said, you don't need the answer for everything. And if anything, I, I have more trust in people when they say, I don't know the answer to this right now, but this is my hypothesis. And this is what it would look like if I were disproven. This is what I would need to do to prove that I'm right, et cetera. And so uh, the more mm -hmm. honest you are with yourself, especially in the early days, I think just the more successful you'll be. It's very easy to get like good customer, good user feedback and just say, done, I have a good product, let's move on. And I think being very thoughtful about it is essential. Agreed. Agreed. With that, Clay, we haven't heard enough from you today, man. Let's yeah. uh, dive into the quick questions and let Clay take over. Yeah, this is where I emerge from under we a rock. We miss you so much. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we do this at the end. We have these quick questions meant to be answered in two sentences or less. We're pretty lenient on that. We aim for it to be two sentences or less. But anyway, you no, get there the will point. be dire consequences. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually don't think we've ever had a single answer be in two sentences or less. I'll try my best. I'll try my best. We'll see. <laughs> All right. So first one we have is what is a recommendation you hear regularly that you think is bad advice? For sure. So I think when you're in college or shortly thereafter, you, a lot of people told me, you know, don't worry about your first couple of jobs, do whatever you want, go with the flow, don't, you know, relax. And I also got, I also, I don't know if you feel this, I feel like people are condescending against people who start building in high school or something like that, create a high school company. And I just hate that. It's one of my pet peeves. I, from my perspective, you don't have to worry about your first jobs, but if you're passionate about something, just go after it, be extra about it. And I, I actually quite admire people who, who do go out of their way to learn new things and be as ambitious as they want to be from whatever age they are. I think that that's one piece of advice is people are like, ah, oh, enjoy, enjoy your time. So a lot of people enjoy their time by being productive and by learning and building and experimenting with different types of products. And if that's what you want to do it. Yeah, that's spot on. I think about if there, if people didn't have that mindset, there'd be no Justin Yoshimura's in the world. Yeah. The next generation made like millions of dollars selling cell phone parts in high school. Yeah, I there's there's a guy who I know uh, who just wrote a book, and he's a 19 year old in college, and someone's like, oh, he has to chill, like he should just enjoy college. I'm like, excuse me, he just wrote a book. It's called it's I'm like it's about deep tech. Uh, it's called making moonshots. If he wants to do that, he should go out and do it. Yeah, people yeah. who aren't doing will always push you down. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hundred percent. I feel like I saw a lot of college students coming out with books after COVID hit. So oh, what am I going to do with my time? I'm going to write a book. Yeah, I admire that greatly. So I'm a big fan. Cool. All right, so bounce around to the next one. So in the last that year- like, That was like 14 sentences, by the way. I'm so yeah, sorry. But, no, I love it. I, but who's I, counting? <laughs> there are a lot of commas in there. Yeah. <laughs> that, was a, that was one really long run on sentences. Yeah, wow. just next one, just make one really big run on <laughs> sentence. <laughs> And therefore. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So next one. In the last year, what new belief, behavior, or habit has most improved your life? Yeah, I think I, I really stopped comparing myself to others. I think it's super easy in college and in banking to be very worried about, oh, this person who's my peer is like doing X, Y, and Z, and I need to do better. And, and I, I think it's great to have healthy competition, but I've really found that the more time you're spending worrying about what other people are doing, the less time you're dedicating to yourself. And so I've, especially since starting venture, it's a competitive landscape and I appreciate that. And I, uh, by the, the attitude I've started having towards it is just applaud the people around you and don't beat yourself down. If you're not doing X, Y, and Z, just stay true to like what you want to be focusing on. And I think that makes the most sense. I've been trying to have that approach. Good advice. Should probably do that more myself. That was another gym. Yeah. Another gym. <laughs> 
We just started right. doing like a gym counter, like how many. <laughs> you're, <there>? nice. <laughs> you're up to two in this episode, so. so. And she broke a record for the longest run-on sentence of all time. So. <laughs> two and a half, two and a half to three. I'm getting um, a lot of awards here. <laughs> <laughs> all right so next one aside from having to say no all the time what's the worst part about venture this is a hard one because i feel like everything we wanted to include this because it seems like when people are breaking in it's like oh we're only going to tell you the rosy stuff once you get it's like all right there are parts of this job there's some shitty like stuff doing. about this job yeah. yeah for sure it's i love the job for, for the record i think maybe it's a corollary to saying no it, and it's less about saying no when you've met with a company but it's about being being thoughtful with your time, I found is super hard. And you just have to be strict about saying, I need to dedicate these amount of hours a day for me to sit down and read and think. And I, I need to be able to you know, say no to even taking the meeting in the first place because I need to be focused on my work. And I, I do think that's the right strategy. I just think it's very easy to fall into the trap of taking a lot of busy meetings because it feels like you're being productive. And so I think that for me is one of the hardest things to just keep true to. Totally agree with that. Next question we have, a lot of this audience kind of skews to analyst associates or even those that are trying to break into venture. What's your best piece of advice for junior VCs or those aspiring to break into venture? Yeah, I actually feel very passionately about this. I feel like there's a lot of content out there that go around the executing in VC side. And I agree with everything that probably everything that's being said, right? This is how you source. This is how you get in front of people. This is how you execute on a deal, et cetera. This is LinkedIn, this person and tweet this person. But I, I think one of them, if I could go back in time and just dedicate more time to something before joining VC or as I started VC, it would, it would truly be creating in-depth opinions about certain spaces and putting more time into that. And I think it's a lot more valuable to have actually thought through theses on spaces than to just be able to ramble off a hundred companies, startup companies that are raising this month, because that's, that's where you're adding value is having an opinion and then executing on that opinion. I totally agree with that. Sure to, as much time as you're dedicating to the networking side of VC, you should be dedicating the same amount, if not more towards the thoughtfulness side of VC. Yeah. I think all VCs specialize in having breadth over depth, which I think actually is if I was asked what's the worst piece of advice that I hear regularly, I think it's having that and just being a generalist and everything. I think in order to like really get the attention of quality entrepreneurs, like you have to be deep on the subject, understand what oh, you're yeah. talking about, ask thoughtful questions or else they're just going to consider you anybody else they could get capital from. It's that, definitely depth over breath. in my Yeah. Mind. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's the other way around. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. All right, so last question on my end. Are there any mentors, one, two, however many you want to name, that you'd want to give credit to? For sure. I think mainly I have to give credit to my partner, Sarah Guo. She, The way I got this job, I didn't mention this, is I've respected her for a very long time. I just you know, really like the way she spoke about her companies, and whether it be on podcasts or videos or Twitter or on the internet. Something about her really stuck with me. And the way I got this job was I cold emailed her. And initially thought maybe, you know, the best thing I would get out of this is a 30 minute conversation. And here I am today. And it's mind boggling that I'm texting this person who I looked up to for such a long time every day now. So definitely Sarah for taking a chance on me and then bringing me, introducing me to the rest of the Greylock team. I also work a lot with our partner, Ashim, who's been at Greylock for about 17 years now and ha has been an incredible asset, has been incredibly kind in taking me to taking the time to teach me a lot of his things. Sam, Jerry, uh, and David at the team as well. We're a pretty small and integrated team, and I, I truly adore everyone. Outside of Greylock, someone at Morgan Stanley who was a big part of my time there, his name's Kyle Corcoran. He actually did all three of those Uber, Uber, Zoom, and Palantir deals with me. So spent a lot of time with Kyle and with Michael Grimes, who was the leader of our group and has just so much advice. What bonus give. money? Sorry? Nothing. I'm joking. I said so much bonus money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Michael's great. And every you think I have gems, like Michael has a lot of gems when I talk to him. It was truly a great experience to learn from them at Morgan Stanley. That's awesome. Oh, if I can one more. Yeah. Kelly Eckelberg. I, I have to give Kelly a, a shout out. She's the CFO of Zoom. Love Kelly. She She's truly an inspiration. Worked with her for the nine plus months that it took us from meeting to the IPO of Zoom. And 
she's just a great leader and it was a great person to work with and we've stayed in contact and I'm a big I'm a big fan of hers and do appreciate like the time that I learned from her it's amazing last thing that we always do Clay you want to sneak this one in yeah I mean who would you want to see on this podcast or in this community that isn't in it already there's a bunch of people. So let me think. I really, there's a bunch of people that I've learned a lot from over time. The first type of people who come to mind, I have some friends at Iconic. Ratika Pai is a good friend of mine and she covers a bunch of companies at Iconic. And I think Iconic is well-named in that it is an Iconic institution and they've done some incredible deals. And so I, I think they're really good thinkers there. I also have, I think IV, I don't know if you've had anyone from IVP, Jason Kong is a, he was actually just on the 30 under 30 list and he's been a great thought partner for me. And so he's been someone that has helped me throughout like my career. And then I think lastly, do you guys know Sean Zhu from Floodgate? He was one of the first people to help me. He actually helped me as I was interviewing for Greylock. I ran a thesis by him. And he was so kind to take that intro from me. And he's at Floodgate. He has some pretty cool investments. He also runs the, the Next Gen Partners VC community. And so I would definitely have him on here. Yo, I'm trying to think. Maybe we have a third of them, those people on the platform. If you could, we ask this of everyone. If someone's not part of the community, we need to get them involved. And the first step to getting them on this podcast is having them be a member. So uh, please cool. let them know. And then if you ever look for an operator, there's one person that obviously there's a bunch of founders that I love. One that I met with again last recently, his name's Kasava Karupa. He's the CEO of a company called Digital Brain. And his story is just incredible. He is like one of the most interesting. He's lived around the world. He biked from Europe to Asia after college, after high school, sorry. And so I'm a huge fan of him. How far is that bike ride? It's like very, <laughs> very it's I like wish this cool, look at face right now. <laughs> there's actually like a video, I think there's like a video on YouTube about it. He's just, he's super cool. And now is the founder of this company, Digital Brain. It was part of the YC cohort in the last couple of cohorts and uh, just great guy. So if you guys ever pivot to also having founders on here, I would definitely talk to him. Maybe we'll start doing like a, a, a founder of the month or something. Might as well. Yeah. Might as well. I think my, I love talking to VCs, don't get me wrong, but I do this job to talk to other, to founders. That those are the people that I think are just so interesting and they have the story, they're doing it day to day. 100%. I think more on our end, like I think more content is good. And like now we've essentially captured the harder to reach audience. Like it would make a lot of sense for us to just host like some of these one-on-one -on -one opportunities to give founders a chance to pitch, tell their story to a cultivated audience of VCs and people that could like potentially partner with them down the road. Content strategy for us down the road. We'll see if what happens with that. But listen, I think that's all the questions on our end. I think we could both talk for another hour or two easily, <laughs> but want to be respectful of your time. Do you have any other, do you have any other last minute questions for us? Yeah. We need to start doing this. Ask us anything. Yeah. More. yeah AMA. I guess I, this is interesting. I feel like I've, so I've, I have a platform here to really get everything out of you. Yeah. What's been, I guess the, the main question here is, have you guys changed your day to day at all in your work based on what you've learned through these podcasts or through anything? Like what's been the big change that you've seen? Tyler, you want to answer that first? I mean, yeah, I think I've learned interesting stuff in every podcast. Last episode with the person who wondered, we went through all the gyms. But honestly, just today alone, I've learned things that I want to block into my day to day, right? Like everyone's dropping gems and giving me ways to like become a better investor. So yeah. I need to start to think about in my investments, like you said, like how are my defense mechanisms within my companies evolve over time? I also heard this discussion in one other, I forget who it was, I've been tailoring back or uh, pulling back the amount of meetings I'm taking. At first I was trying to meet every single person that joined Confluence. Mm -hmm. which now are like a thousand people. <laughs> it's like yeah. kind of hard. It's a lot of time. Um, and I just stopped three, four weeks ago. It's been kind of tough. And I wanted to spend a lot more time doing, doing like deep dives. While it does take a lot of time to build confluence for, for me and Clay, I think one thing that we've figured out how to do now is find ways to align what we need to do as investors 
with yeah. things that are happening on the platform and, and the same for the people on the platform. So in regards to my day to day, like I'm doing the same things, like I'm still meeting with founders. I'm still yeah. talking to my partners about how we can add value to our existing portfolio partners and family members. I'm still going out and developing theses. But what I will say is now I feel like I have a superpower and everyone else on the platform has a superpower because if I want to get smart on something like RPA, for instance, I'm like, hey, yeah. who are the top 10 people on this platform who've done sick RPA deals? Let me yeah. get them all in a group and let's like co-author something and make it really cool. And uh, really that, in my opinion, is the, the biggest way that my days change other than just checking in on what the community's talking about. It, it runs itself at this point. I love hearing what people have questions on and seeing what people post in terms of their companies and things of that nature. Yeah, no, it's definitely the most, I think the most, I mean, my favorite relationships with people in VC are, are the ones where you are talking about content and like, it's a lot more exciting to get on a call with someone and say, oh, okay, let's actually go in depth about a space that we're both looking at. And, and that's truly my favorite because all of a sudden you, 30 minutes just turns into, you know, three hours worth of work that would have otherwise been. And said, so now you're just like summarizing the key takeaways that you're learning from other people. It's a study guide almost, right? You're sharing notes with your peers. And so those are the best. Yeah. I'll give you a sneak peek into what we have next in terms of January. It's like within the Slack groups and even within the member subgroups, we've broken out people by the sectors they look at. So we want to do these deep dives and like these investor roundtables by like investors that say they invest at the seed stage and agriculture tech. And we want to have three to five. We haven't determined the right amount of investors and just have a structure for them to follow uh, be like trends they're following, companies they're monitoring, like what the next three months look like, and then do that on a quarterly basis for all the different sectors we have, yeah. which is extremely valuable for everybody. Because as you said, rather than doing these deep dives yourself and just relying on what you can find on Google, like yeah. you, you can just list of what other people have to say on it. Yeah, because there is, there is, to some degree, there's almost too much content. content. You, you need like, aggregators. Yeah, having desperately. someone say, hey, this is good, is actually super valuable. There's, I have some people that I do that with, and you just, your whole conversation is just like links back and forth. And mm -hmm. I was just, because it's a friend that you can do that with, and you can just share, you're sharing your learnings, and that's the best, right? Yeah. That's the thought partnership. If you were to ask, like, why did this is for that type of thought partnership, like, why I'm in VC. I also just think it'd be very naive and cocky of us to believe that we could solve for all the craziest things all in our own head. Like, I love and respect my peers, like, oh yeah, mental structures. And also, there's no way possible I could come up with as many RPA companies in, like, an efficient amount of time yeah. as if I were to group with a few of the homies, right? And have fun while doing it. Yeah. Um, and having a point of view of actually what help. There are some, I think there, and this goes back to the most, there are some industries where the question is about what architecture works, like what product actually has reinvented the wheel and is doing said workflow in a better way. And mm -hmm. that's, there, there are some decisions where you have to make it based on that type of question. And those are not easy questions to answer. And it's much different than I'm investing based on a go-to-market idea. And that's also a difficult question to answer, but like a different, completely different space. And so I think having certain people that you trust as expert in areas, whether it be a product area or like a type of marketing area or go-to-market area, like those are great people to have that you can rely on. Agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Okay. I think. Yeah. It's been I great chatting with you guys. It's been phenomenal. It's been Thank amazing. you so much for your time. I appreciate you and, and all your flattering callings of my sentences gems. Um, <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I'm flattered, truly. <laughs>